The show is brought to you by our generous patrons at patreon.com slash falloutlorecast. Robots Radio presents the Fallout Lorecast. Welcome to the Fallout Lorecast, a place for the Fallout community to come together to explore the boundaries of our knowledge about the world of Fallout. Wastelanders, Vault Dwellers, welcome back to the Fall Lorecast. This is the first episode of the new year, and this is also a big deal because we finally have approval to get you guys the interview that I was hoping to release in the middle of December. It is now the new year, and um, Bethesda was on vacation, basically. A lot of people were on vacation in the middle and towards the end of December, and we were waiting to get approval on this interview. Ken from Fallout, a 76 podcast. Uh, you guys know the shows. You're all familiar with all the shows. Ken and I do the Fallout Hub show together. We had the opportunity to interview two of the devs from Fallout 76. And we've been sitting on this interview for weeks now. This was the episode that I was hoping to get out a few weeks ago. And now we can actually get it out to you. So... Stay, stay tuned. That's what's coming. Um, do note that, of course, this was an interview. It was done over Zoom. It was a live interview. It was streamed at the time. So if you happen to catch that during all of the Fallout for Hope stuff, this was something that showed up live during that. But then, but then of course, it was recorded. It was archived and it had to go and be put away in order to get full approval to for the recorded version to go back out. So audio quality isn't perfect. The, um, you know, I've cleaned it up as best as I can, but there's definitely some audio canceling that happens when one person talks and then another person talks. And then, um, some people's mics are a little bit better than others. So please be patient with the audio quality, but I think the content is really good. We got to ask a lot of questions about the most recent event going on at fall in fall 76 that of course the patch that came out in December and then some of the stuff that's going down down the pipeline and um this is the first time we got to interview these two guests who I'm going to introduce as soon as I got done uh you know talking to you right here during the intro of this episode so stay tuned for that and then happy new year everybody this is going to be an exciting year for the fall at lorecast I'm going to be digging into more Fallout 76 lore this year. We're going to get back to some more lore focused episodes with just me. That's where things are going once we move past this episode and into some more of the regular episodes for this year. Um, we're transitioning back to a kind of a different schedule because I'm not going to have as many of the, you know, talking heads co-host kind of shows because I'm doing this by myself now for for a while we've had some of those again at the end of last year with the what if series and I think it's time to dig back into Fallout 76 lore specifically and get into some of the things that I haven't covered yet with that game in particular and so get get ready for that the episodes are going to be a lot more like the way the show was at the beginning of the show a little bit shorter episodes but a lot more focused on lore dumps <laughs> just information in your face and ethical questions and things like that so that's where we're going with it and i hope you guys enjoy the interview so without further ado here you go hello there old chap Good to see another of General Atomic's finest still eager to serve. I'm Tom, or Robots, and this is Ken from the Chad Fallout 76 podcast, and we both are on the Fallout Hub. And so welcome, everybody. And um, we are here with some very special guests today, Senior Quest Designer uh, Carl McKevitt and Art Director John Rush from Fallout 76. Welcome, guys. Hello. Thanks for having us. Thank you yeah. for having us. Thank you for taking the time to join us today um, to answer some questions. It is always exciting for both Ken and I to get to talk to you guys. Big fans of all of your work. And uh, I know that you don't always get the time. I know you guys are very busy um, to be able to answer questions about the games that you work on. Uh, but thank you for taking that time to talk with us. Um, yeah, of course. We like to start out our interviews with 
some some quick uh, questions. This is the robots dozen. Don't think too hard about these. These are meant to be just quick, top of mind, loosen the loosen you up, just kind of throw out the first thing that comes to mind. And these are supposed to be real fast because we want to oh, get no. real juicy stuff. So we're going to go back and forth. We're going to start with Carl. The first question is ready. Mm-hmm. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Freezing things. Freezing things. I don't know why. Carl is wow, an immediate is... villain. Like or like Iceman. Yeah, I, Iceman's a goodish guy. Uh, yeah, he started out. He started out mostly good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like cryo, cryo Carl. <laughs> cryo. They, yeah, it's it's yeah. It is my uh, my attraction towards wordplay like that. <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right. Let's move over to John. John, where would you go if I was to just all of a sudden give you a time machine? Oh, uh, boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, where would I go if you gave me a time machine? Right. First thing I, I think I'd have to go back to the, the, the times of the, the knights, knights and castles and Danville's in distress. Nice. Medieval Europe? Yeah, yeah. there you go. Any specific country? Hmm. We'll have to go with, uh, go with Scotland. Scotland. Go over to, to Scotland. Man, everyone would look at you like, what are you talking about? And every other word they wouldn't understand. That would be amazing. Exactly. That would be so that would be so cool. And then you'd get like burned at the stake. They think you're like a witch or something. That would be great. That would be- <laughs> I was gonna say there's there's plagues and yeah. inquisitions and those sorts of things. But right, right. it'll be all right. Yeah, he's just be visiting. Just be visiting the place, you know. <laughs> all right, back to Carl. What is your favorite quote? Oh no. <laughs> That's your favorite quote. That's a great one. It is now. <laughs> I t- uh, uh, it is a quote from my wife on this post-it note that says, "P.S. Do your time cards." That's my favorite quote. What's your favorite quote. That's hey, I'm an adult and I need to be reminded to fill out time cards. Hey, it's going to keep you out of trouble. So yeah. right now, that makes sense to be your favorite quote. I like that. All right, John, hmm. is there intelligent life out in the universe? Absolutely. That Looking was out. boom. Yeah. All right. Uh, back to Carl. What would you? How would you get an elephant into a refrigerator? A hacksaw. That's messy way to do it. <laughs> Carl, what is going on there with the ice and the murdering of an elephant with a hacksaw? <laughs> I mean, the ice powers would probably make it a little bit easier to break apart. So maybe I should have said sledgehammer. That would have. Oh man, that would have helped. Is that even, is that better? Oh, uh, <laughs> more convenient. Poultice are starting to kind of get to him a bit. I think he's kind of freezing real hard, and then you just like whack off all the limbs with a sledgehammer, and then they just crack. Right. That's how you do it. Off all the pieces in the refrigerator. I can see where you go. All right, John. What three items would you take? To a desert island other than food and water. Three items would I take other than food and water? Well, you, got, you have to have cigars. Okay. You have, cigar. you have to have a lighter for the cigar, of course. There you go. All right. Um, I'd probably bring, uh, well, I'd probably bring a, a solar powered fan. All right. All right. Cigar, lighter, fan, food solar water. powered. <laughs> Solar powered fan, very important. Solar powered fan, right, right. Yeah. No electric outlets on the side. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, and then food and water. I okay. thought maybe you're going to go with like bourbon and just kind of be like <laughs> living the life. Yeah. Now he's regretting his choices. <laughs> yeah, now, now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> All right. Well, you're going to be you're going to limit it up on that. <laughs> on that island um all right let's go back to carl carl why are manhole covers round um (laughs) uh let's see ladies and gentlemen listen to the car this is called dead air yes this is (laughs) this is uh i've I've never been more perplexed by a question (laughs) because they're not they're not square because they're not yeah that was the first thing but it it wasn't a satisfying answer (laughs) um 
I mean, nope. Nope. Oh, nope. 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 Got nothing. Brown. Sorry. No, no answer. There's no, no good answer. answer. There's no, there is no good answer for why. The answer is that there is no good answer. Yes. All right. All right. Now, um, Ken, uh, you wrote this one. Is the, the first word on this one supposed to be who? No, it should be how. Okay. All right. So I was wondering about that because it, it didn't make sense to me, but I didn't know if maybe you're just going, getting weird with this one. Um, how would you title your autobiography? You can see why who would be weird on that one. Uh, John? For me, how, how would you title it? How would you title your autobiography? How would I title my autobiography? Hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, like you have an answer. Did you just laugh yeah. at your own answer? You went into your mind palace to review different ideas. And- <laughs> How would I have my autobiography? Boy, I don't know, man. He does know. He just can't share it. That's a great one. I don't know, man. For some suggestions, I think. Calling a friend. Uh, Calling a friend. That's, that's a viable option. Let's go with the... Um, the better half of Tucker and Rush. Oh, a, a story of music. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate that. Uh, oh, some gosh. inside story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So our our uh, our director is Mark Tucker, uh, oh, yeah. who works uh, in collaboration with Mr. Rush pretty often, and they have a uh, band who I've yet to see perform, though I believe that they did during a company talent show. Uh, Tucker and Rush. You guys did do something, right? You. Uh, oh, it's it's actually it's Rush and Tucker. It is not Rush and Tucker. And Tucker. It is, oh no! It is absolutely Tucker and Rush. We've, we've kind of gone the way of Loggins and Messina. It's like, well, who's Messina? He used to, put, you know, that's kind mm-hmm. of Tucker. Mm-hmm. He's had his diva moments, you know, and it was just time for us to part ways. But Oxygen <laughs> Network is doing a, uh, a uh, kind of a documentary Oxygen. on us, sort of like the Beatles, the you know, except they're. Uh, you know, it's 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 certainly not one sided. It's directed by me, but it, it kind of goes. It's called Get Out. It's not Get Back. It's Get Out. That's a little bit. Perfect. <laughs> so much for really quick answers. <laughs> oh yeah. <sorry. laughs> oh, isn't even the best drummer in the Beatles? All right. How about how about we go back to Carl? Carl, cat or dog? Dog. Always dog. That is the right answer. <laughs> John. What do you think of garden gnomes? I'm in favor of garden gnomes. What was that? I'm in favor of garden gnomes. I think I think garden gnomes would make excellent turrets. <laughs> that would actually be hilarious if they were secret ones where their mouth would just drop open and. Uh... Well, I just know what I, I want to recommend for the Adam shop now. <laughs> Carl's making notes. <laughs> Their their mouths open like um like uh like the little nutcracker guys for like yeah, holiday. Exactly. Their mouths go and then there's like a little gun turret that goes out like, of them. Like the yeah. Robin Williams movie Toys. Do you remember that little doll walking along the hallway and then like the chin yeah, came out of her mouth <laughs> comes out and then they just go. Garden gnomes are like they're like Smurf mannequins. <laughs> yes, that's a garden gnome. Yes, I like it. All right, Carl. Last question. Mm-hmm. Brotherhood or Raider? I'd say Settler. Settler. I'm a I'm a pretty na, non-violent kind of guy. Yeah, fanatic. that's the impression we've gotten with you chopping up frozen elephants. Nobody said. <laughs> nobody said the elephant was still alive. I just want to say it, it may have been a butcher situation. I had to deal with you know. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, that seems pretty raider to me. So you say what you want, but I think we know the real answer here. Okay, Settler, who is a low-key raider, um, <laughs> secretly planning to uh, lead an invasion. We'll go with that. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, here, I'm, I'm going to alter this last one just uh, just a hair to make it more Fallout-centric. John, money is no object. You have all the caps that you could possibly have, and tomorrow you can do anything you want. And you're in the wasteland. What do you do? What do I do with all the caps in the wasteland? I give it to somebody who just came out of the vault. Aww. Aww. See, Carl, now, John, that's a real settler type. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just saying. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll kill the player that he gave the caps to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the caps from his limb. Shove them in the refrigerator. Yeah. It's the strangest right. thing. The body was found in a fridge, uh, frozen and chopped up into pieces. <laughs> yeah. And yet the fridge wasn't plugged in. How did it freeze? We'll never know. A powered fridge, obviously, Carl. It was, it was solar powered. There was a solar powered fan in the fridge. Yeah, exactly. And they found, <laughs> they found a cigar sitting on the corner of the fridge for some reason. So it all connects back. Who left the cigar? Storytelling. All right. Thank you for answering the robots dozen questions. You are now officially part of the show, and we also have a readout here. Let me uh, pull this up. All right, we um, you've secretly taken your vats, uh, and it is telling me now, Carl, that you are a uh, you're set up to be a professional dog walker. Congratulations! Your yeah, it's a, the goat. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, your goat. Uh, that's uh, your that was that, that was to trick me, right? That was. <laughs> that was, that was part of it. Yes, uh, your goat. Yes, and uh, you're a professional dog walker. And John, it says that you are a. Um, is this right? A Republican politician. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's what the goat says. But uh, welcome to the show, and uh, yeah. let's uh, let's get let's get on with some questions. So first of all, let's let's get into a little bit of your background, Carl. How did you get started with gaming? Um, it's gonna sound like a joke, but it's not. <laughs> um, actually, I so I learned Korean, um, and uh, by knowing Korean, I was able to get a job writing a summary. Uh, on a Korean MMO game that a company was considering to bring over here. They needed somebody who had some game design background. I, coming out of college, I had game design as my background. And they needed somebody who could actually play this game in Korean, um, which I, I did. I wrote up a 60-page document. That person immediately left the company, never reading it, uh, wow. but brought me to their next job. And then it was a long string of, uh, of opportunities after that. So a little bit of luck and a little bit of knowledge of a foreign language that was uh that's how i broke in wow that's a that's a really roundabout way to do it that's like that's crazy crazy now john how did you get started in in gaming and in, in the industry yeah so I, I think i think like probably all of us here I've, I've played games since i was just a little kid all the way back to I'm about to age myself all the way back to the atari you know beating my dad at donkey kong <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's it, just playing them all through high school and through some of college and towards the end of college, you know, I was studying, I was studying studio art and I was kind of wondering what I was going to do with that degree, maybe teach or, or something. And, uh, I started to notice like a lot of the similarities in how the art for games was made, uh, weighed against what I was, what I was doing in school. And so just. Uh, they just kind of fit together and I thought well this is this is something I absolutely have to do so spent spent about a year or so learning the software it wasn't taught at my school at the time there wasn't much much online about it so a lot of trial and error and then ended up sending out about 100 emails hey hire me uh, and eventually somebody said yes so that's all it took was one person to say yes and there I am wow wow that's cool that's that's really neat now um now, for each of you, and we'll go back to Carl on this one, when did you first discover Fallout? It is something I was aware of. I was not a, and this is sacrilegious to say, I was not a PC gamer growing up. <gasps> um, so, I'm sorry. So, uh, in fact, I had bought Morrowind um, for the PC and was unable to play it because my PC was not powerful enough. Uh, so I had to wait years for the, or a year or two, I guess, until the Xbox version came out uh, and I played on there. That was my introduction into the Elder Scrolls and Greater Bethesda family. But for the the older versions, that was a thing I saw in magazines. And I was like, that looks cool. I'll, I'll never be able to play that. Um, so going into Fallout 3 was kind of my opportunity to say, hey, this is made by a studio that I love. It's a property I've heard of. Super exciting. Um, I got you know, pre-ordered the special edition with the lunchbox, um, which I had Todd Howard and Emil both sign. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And had to sneak back into the office to get it back before somebody stole it because, <laughs> you know, uh, but, uh, you know, that was kind of, I, I kind of came from it at an, almost at an Elder Scrolls angle where I was a big fan of Elder Scrolls and I was, and the Bethesda by extension. And so I just kind of said, I trust that 
if they think this was a really cool property that I'm also going to love this property. And sure enough, I did. Now, what, what do you specifically love about fallout? Like what, it, what, what about it made you kind of fall in love with it? I think there's just something about the aesthetic, this, um, it is the future, but it's also not the future. It is a nostalgia for a thing that has never actually existed before. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, stuff from the, the 1950s, 1960s time period. Uh, even newer stuff that's set in that, like Mad Men as an example. Um, so I, that I've always kind of enjoyed that vibe and having a unique spin on it of it's both the future and it's futuristic technology, but it's also from that time and then the apocalypse. It's all just kind of it, it's such a unique setting that like, you know, there's nothing else really like it. Yeah, John, yeah. what about you? Well, I mean, it, I, I had played Fallout since since the series began, but I think I think when it really kind of sank its teeth into me was with with three, um, three and of course four. Uh, you know, just being drawn to, I love the open exploration, exploring all the little details of the world, taking the time to read through the terminals and the stories and sort of piecing together, uh, piecing together everything that happened. Um, I love that contrast between the, 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 the 1950s feel plus that, you know, apocalyptic wasteland, um, and trying to find the sweet spot in between the two. I think Fallout's always done a fantastic job with that. Yeah. It's also a great space for humor. Um, it's, a, it's a game that can get very dark. It can get very serious, cover some uh, really serious themes. But it also never takes itself seriously enough that it can't have fun with it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I always enjoy that. And I think in a lot of my quests, they can get a little bit wacky. Um, but that's also, you know, it's one of my favorite parts of the series. Right. Yeah. Ken and I talk a lot about this, how uh, Fallout can hit both extremes. It can both be very dark and very serious. And it talks about like the deepest, darkest sides of humanity, but it can also be super silly and super wacky at the same time. Like, and, and, and in some ways, that's the way we as humans deal with those dark things is, is with humor. Um, so it, it runs that whole spectrum, which is part of what's so interesting and enjoyable about, about the Fallout series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say, I, I was fortunate that um, I, you know, I only joined the company back in 2018. So I came in as a fan. Um, so it's really it, it's been pretty thrilling to be able to, to write for that really unique setting um, that I literally couldn't write about that setting anywhere but here. So it's uh, worked out pretty well. So, yeah, the setting is a big deal. Do you still have moments where, it, because you've been such a fan, you you walk into the office and you're just like, "This is this is real. This is my life." Yeah, this no, and all, all the time there are surreal moments of like, I can't believe I just witnessed that or was a part of that, and I can't tell you about any of it, but <laughs> it is one surreal, awesome moment after another for sure. So, Carl, how would you how would you explain what? What exactly is quest design to you? Like sure. when you when you take that on, like what what is that? Uh, it is a position that's very different at various companies. Um, for in in some places, quest designer just means writer. Um, you are writing the quest structure, of, and you know there is somebody who will implement that content. In some cases, it is just the implementer. It's somebody uh, who has a team of writers who's who writes what the content will be and the dialogue, and they implement that vision of it. At Bethesda, we have a, uh, we call it kind of a unicorn in terms of the, the skill set. It's a combination of both creating the content and writing the content at the same time. Um, and it is, it's really challenging, um, but it's, uh, it's also, it's super rewarding as well. But just in terms of what we do for the games that uh, everybody plays, uh, if it is a quest that appears in your pit boy, uh, either a quest designer or a level designer has put that in. Um, for most of what's in 76, especially the main quests um, and really anything that has a lot of dialogue in it, uh, a quest designer is the person who uh, put all the steps in that the player has to do to uh, complete that quest and wrote all the dialogue for it. Um, and also coordinated with the other teams on creating the rewards, the the looks for the NPCs, all those sorts of things. Everything is super uh, collaborative, but 
it's uh, we're kind of the person who, who puts in uh, every step of the way to get from the quest to beginning to end. So how does that relate to level design? Like, what's the distinction there? Uh, it, it depends on if we're planning to build content for an area that has already uh, been designed. Sometimes a dungeon has been created as just an exploration space, and later we decide, hey, we want to put a story in there. Or if it's a story uh, that is taking place in a new space. So Steel Rain is a good example. Uh, Harper's Ferry... Um, train tunnel that was a new space uh that was a huge effort by level design by art very collaborative to kind of uh both first come up with what happens down there but then also build the space around it so that in that case it, it is a hand in hand every step along the way quest level design and arts working together um in other cases quest designs coming into a space that level has already created um and it's more of a talking with them about the space and any improvements you can make um, but it sometimes, you know, it really just depends on the context. Makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. So, um, so in quest design, you, you also get involved with the writing and the scripting, like, is that part of your role? Yes. Um, I, I won't take any credit as the greatest scripter on the planet. Um, but it is, it is something that we are in charge of. Um, we have, you know, engineers who help us out and that sort of thing. But, uh, in, when it comes to quest design, we often, uh, have to make our bed and then lie in it when it comes to that work. So, uh, if we have a really ambitious, cool idea for something that the player does along the way, um, you know, it takes, uh, it's a team effort, but it comes down to us to try to try to actually implement that content. In a yeah. way, it's, it's it's almost like your your director of like a, a mini play or like like almost like a mini anthology in that you're you're mm -hmm. directing, you're writing, you're coordinating with different teams. Even though in title, that's it means something very different in game design. It's kind of what you do. Yeah, it can it can feel that way for sure. Sometimes we are, um, <clears throat> I'd say, a member of the band, uh, and you especially if we're, we're writing uh, for content that is a system or outside of. Um, you know, a straight quest or something like that. But when it comes to a quest itself, we often have to kind of um, carry the torch on uh, what that content is because everybody has so much work to do all the time that, you know, you've got to basically be the person who's got the eye on your quest to make sure everything's getting done there for it. Yeah, so um, Fallout 76, being that it is a multiplayer version of Fallout, there's in creating these story quests i'm sure there are some differences between creating a quest in fallout 76 as opposed to creating something for just a, a fully single player game even though you can go through those storylines single player yeah for sure can we talk about the differences between creating like a quest line for a fully single player game versus 76 mm -hmm. because like it it is different and this is one of those things that like as a player i i can feel that it's a little bit different but to me i can just jump in to play it right but from your perspective i'm sure it's it's a much bigger thing than we would, we would understand as players yeah and I, I can really only speak to my own uh experience because um you know it, it's a large team that, that built the quests that are in there um but and a lot of consideration goes into each of them. But for the quests that I have worked on personally, um, one of the big factors to, that always has to be kept in mind is that there's only so much um, impact that we can allow the player to really do before we start to make um, it difficult for the future um, moving forward. So there's only you know we we can't as an example allow the player to nuke. Well, <laughs> that's not true. They could nuke a place, but to, to nuke away and uh, the way that uh, in at the beginning at Fallout Three in the Ten Penny Tower, you know, you can destroy a megaton and that makes a permanent crater in the world. Those are those are the types of impacts we really can't pursue. So we try to find ways to make the story more meaningful to the player on a personal level and not necessarily on a massive environmental way. Um, that said, I, I feel like the the um, that restriction in mind hasn't really changed many of the ideas that we want to do when it comes to storytelling um you know 76 i feel like has really let us craft the stories we wanted to tell um and it's uh it, it's always a consideration in the back of our heads that like we got to remember that 
this is a world full of players who are also on their own adventures. Um, we want them to feel like they're making significant choices, uh, but at the same time, you know, we've got to we've also got to keep the the fabric of the universe of seventy six in one piece for all the different players that are in it. If you know anything about me, you know that I'm totally into stories that are really dense with lore, interesting characters, dark and mysterious worlds. And that's why I'm excited about our sponsor today. You've probably heard of the hit show Shadow and Bone streaming on Netflix. But did you know that that series is based on the Grishaverse, the number one New York Times bestselling books by Lee Bardugo? Now, I'm excited because season two of the hit show Shadow and Bone is now streaming on Netflix. But if you're interested like I am in exploring the universe more or just getting into a really solid fantasy world, then go check out the books. The Grishaverse is a lavish fantasy world in which science and magic collide. So if you haven't already, I recommend you get started with the book Six of Crows, learn more about Alina Starkov's journey, and enjoy a universe that Bustle calls the best magic universe since Harry Potter. To learn more, go to Grishaverse.com, that's G-R-I-S-H-A-V-E-R-S-E.com, or go pick up your copy of Six of Crows wherever books are sold. Yeah, that's interesting, because there's the distinctions between the things that affect everybody and the things that affect you. And your emotional relationships with certain characters are definitely things that are more focused on you than necessarily other people. Whereas, you know, if all of a sudden, uh, you know, a certain part of the map just disappeared, it, you couldn't necessarily implant, implement that for everyone. So, so that makes right. sense. Yeah. yeah. And the, um, uh, the Red Rocket Collectron was something that, that you contributed to in terms of design and dialogue. Did the design of him come from any particular source? And in a way, he's a lot like very 1950s sci-fi comic. Uh, I'll let, I'll let John take that one. Yeah, so there was, uh, so I'm not sure who the original artist was. It was one of the concept artists, I believe, for Fallout 4 had painted out this robot, just like a waist up for a Red Rocket commercial. And I think it was hanging up by our coffee machine in the office or something. I was like, you know, that would make a really cool collectron. <laughs> So, like, you know, let's 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 flesh out the rest of it. So, you know, drew out, we uh, concepted out the, the the rest of the the collectron, had that built out, and collaborated with with animation and, and with design on what type of personality this this uh, character would have, how it recharges, right? How it goes up to the the, the kind of red rocket station and then it plugs itself back in. And the head sort of bobs up and down. The animation and, of yeah. that is so cool. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, kind of, kind of inspired by an idea from from art that had been done internally for for a previous iteration of of Fallout, and then you know, express that idea to the different disciplines, and everybody just kind of gets together, and and there you go. Periodically, because I mean, Fallout has been cranking on for a long time now. Every now and then, do you do you take a look back, or, or happen to see something that was maybe an early concept sketch or from a previous game? You think. What if we could what if we could bring this into 76 all the time absolutely yeah so something i've noticed uh in the game industry from working on other games is that it's always good to especially on games as a service right to continue on and continue on it's always good to go back and and, and look at where it started right to see to see if you veered too far away from what what the original uh, vision of the of the title was or or if there's room to expand on that anymore so yeah i mean constantly we've got a, a great library of, of of past concept for fallout 3 and fallout 4 it's always good to go through and look at that see what people were thinking even stuff that wasn't used, especially stuff Stuff that wasn't used there's there's always little ideas like lurking in in, in the corners of uh, of these concepts that, that prompt new ideas that That's are very awesome. relevant to the game yeah it's a nice bit of continuity and a little bit of nostalgia too yeah it's really important and there's kind of a sort of a fine line that you have to walk between referencing that material and then simply just uh repeating yourself, right? Oh, we're going to do this again. It's, you know, it's another helmet with spikes. So it's another helmet with spikes. Another, you always have to find ways to make it fresh. Some, some small thing to make it seem new. Um, during the, uh, when we were all playing, uh, before we actually got onto the stream, there was some conversation about the Enclave items on the, in the Atom shop and uh, how there was, they're kind of callbacks to some very early art that showed up in, in Fallout 1. 
uh, with Enclave stuff in the bunker, I believe in the, um, what was it? The master's bunker or no, it was a, uh, no, no. What, uh, was it, uh, Oregon, Oregon's bunker? What was yeah, that? It was actually that, uh, that kind of, uh, that Enclave base, uh, right. that you find Frank Horgan in. Yeah. Frank Horgan, right. Yeah. And, um, how that was uh, a reference. And then and that's, that's really cool. I, I guess that's a representation of kind of pulling these, uh, references from previous work and, bringing them back and kind of redoing them. Would you, would you say that that's kind of an example? Sure. Yeah. You know, especially with the atomic shop, uh, one of the challenges is to introduce these, these new things that'll, that'll enrich players experiences, uh, get them to be able to play how they feel like they want to play the game, but also not conflict with lore. Right. So t it, looking at the timeline and the continuity, you know, Frank Horgan, possibly exist right in 76 but we can reference some of the shapes and some of the language that was going on with with the power armor and kind of reimagine something different but that is still very much enclave and so that same uh sort of uh mentality applied to the power armor and to the to the turrets uh, to the to the laser field doors, right? This is this is what they would look like if 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 the enclave had those, and, and keeping it nice and consistent um, yeah. from, from that fallout on up to where we are now. Yeah, yeah, it would it would make sense that the enclave would be uh, into a certain kind of design aesthetic, even if things were kind of you know from a different time period it, it would still make sense that they would like a certain aesthetic so sure yeah yeah on, on play should look very you know very engineered uh even almost manufactured a little a little higher tech than than other things you might find in the world right the the shapes for the enclave things they won't be so simple they'll be uh, they'll have a little bit more complex silhouettes to them it just makes them stand out from like brotherhood of steel items right or even yeah. uh, or even items like that you'd find with uh carl's fellow settlers <laughs> uh, the, the blue <laughs> oh oh yeah 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 the actual set i thought you meant the blue ridge mm -hmm. i was gonna say <laughs> it's the small things that in culmination when you see them all at once it's what makes the enclave enclave right yeah yeah it looks like it, um they had more sophistication around the design than being kind of hodgepodge together out in the wasteland. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So from a, from your perspective, what, getting back to your role, what, what do you consider an art director's position? Like what, what do you do as the art director? Well, I mean, you know what, exactly what an art director is, it, it kind of depends on on the studio that you're in, right? It's like these these titles they they, they mean different things in, in different studios. Um, so uh, for for an art director on the on Fallout seventy six, um, I suppose what that means is uh, you know of course uh, you are you're working with designers, right, to expand the game, expand the lore, while still making sure that uh, we maintain a visual cohesion with with uh, with the Fallout universe. We don't stray too far out, right? Um, me specifically, you know, I, I do that. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to theme uh, the Atomic Shop, the weeks for the Atomic Shop. Uh, I'm able to contribute a lot of ideas for the items that go in for those weeks and, and work with animators and designers and, and fleshing those out more fully. Um, and, you know, it's kind of one of the unique things I think about working for Bethesda. And that's kind of why I, I touched on the role being different in different studios with Bethesda. You know, it's 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 such a creative and organic uh, experience making these games that people people don't need to feel like they are kind of pigeonholed into a specific role you know you can you can you can write things you you can suggest things to artists you can you can take on things that you may not uh have access to in 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 other studios and contribute so so i don't know if that answers your question i'm kind of yeah I'm kind of talking now but yeah. I, do, I do need to um Let's give a two-year apology to one of our artists who came up with an excellent name for the weapon that uh, that Graham uses. Um, he wanted to name it the Graham Slam, which, in <laughs> retrospect, was an amazing name. Um, <laughs> that's an awesome. And we really, we really should add, add a legendary variant of it that's named that because. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, speaking of, of writers, uh, our uh, artists contributing in, in other ways. 
Nice. Nice. <laughs> so, um, so what other things have you drawn inspiration from and, and your team uh, when it comes to things like um, uh, local history around West Virginia or some of the weapons or um, some of the things uh, around even Night of the Moth? Like, uh, are there, are there specific, uh, uh, can you think of specific examples of some of the, you know, some of the local flavor or some of the local, you know, historical bits? that you've kind of pulled history, like inspiration from? Just for, for Carl or, or for myself? For you, for John, for, for the oh, well, art inspiration. Yeah, so of course, you know, first thing is, is of course, steeping yourself in the, the Fallout lore so that you understand where all these, all these things came from. Uh, on a personal level, I love movies. I love watching films. I watch tons of films every week, and it, the older the better, right? So 40s, 50s. Um, and so I'll, I'll sometimes be watching those and just sort of get, hey, that's kind of neat. What would happen if that was placed in a post-apocalyptic universe like Fallout? How would that how would that change? Um, you know, for for Carl's Carl's event, uh, Amazon's got some cool uh, documentaries on the Mothman. Get on there and, and you know watch those and kind of learn what the history is, the legend, and that prompts ideas as well. So um, I think I think kind of a sort of a, an open ended answer to your question is you just got to keep eyes open and because you never know where you're going to get the inspiration from. Uh, it could really could really be anything. Yeah. So you kind of just keep keep the feelers open, just kind of pull from everywhere. Oh, yeah. And keep it open. Yeah. Yeah. What about uh, so do you look at West Virginia history as well with uh, the Appalachia Thunderpipe, Appalachian Thunderpipe, rather? Um, apple at you. Apple just at you. I'm going to throw an apple at you. Dave corrected me several times. In the first episode of our podcast, I called it Appalachia and I was corrected right. quickly. Um, but like the the Appalachian Thunderpipe. Um, is a great design. Um, do you look at, you know, Civil War era kind of things to, to shape some of your designs? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of delving into into the history of, of West Virginia, um, looking into like Civil War era designs, like uh, the, like the cart mounted, you know, Gatlin guns in, in, in the case of this, this uh, weapon. Merging those with our our handheld uh, crank Gatling gun and, and seeing what comes out of that just through you know, just through experimenting. Hey, what would this look like? And then sort of previewing it in three D if we want to take it any further. So uh, yeah, just sort of I guess it's kind of kind of a collage of of ideas and and tidbits of history and, and bits of the game and kind of mix them up and see what comes out. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes the same for the content we write too. Um, you know, we uh, we have a big kind of master list of uh, holidays and kind of special events that are specific to West Virginia. And whenever it comes time to start thinking through ideas, we kind of we go back to that. I mean, um, I, I don't know if any how many people knew what Foschnacht was before <laughs> seventy six. I know I certainly didn't. Um, I think but, a heck of you know, a lot more people know now. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a good chance of that. But, you know, there there is a lot of unique culture um, from that, that region. Um, so, you know, we, we um, try to sample that as much as we can. Now, I had, uh, I had a question for John. So uh, I had a little LinkedIn lurk <laughs> because uh, I didn't know too much about your background. And uh, you wrote the initial script and storyboard and produced and directed the E3 2021 pit trailer from start to finish and we know you cannot talk about that at all but from an art <laughs> standpoint uh what is it like to revisit a classic fallout location like the pit well i mean it's it's exciting and it's daunting at the same time right i mean it was it was done so well and it, and it resonated with fans uh so deeply you, you know the first first impression is like oh man hope we don't mess it up <laughs> uh you know we we not not that we would but but it's you know it's very intimidating uh, i suppose and it's trying to f figure out what the what the core elements of uh, of that content was what what are the things that that made that that the pit you know and, and sort of working that out with with the other disciplines to to come up with what we're doing is the pit some kind of concert venue i don't it's never heard of it 
<laughs> that's a, that's my way of saying we're we're <laughs> we're probably not going to say anything else about the pit. Right. <laughs> like I totally understand the the like the human response of like oh this is a big big responsibility you're going to take it seriously, right? Like oh you feel like you really got to do a good job with it. That's, I mean it kind of feels like that for everything we do, right? Like it's uh, Fallout is has such a legacy to it, uh, you know, both before the the modern games and and during it. It's uh, we never want to disappoint. So it's a, you know, yeah. it's always a high bar to live up to. Yeah. Well, uh, Ken, what do you, what do you say we move on to some of the uh, night of yeah, the month questions? Let's do that. I want to, I want to make sure that we get time to do that. So um, can, this is for either of you guys. Uh, let's just open up the questions with, first of all, what is the story of the night of the moth? What can you tell us about this? Sure. Uh, so uh, I mentioned this a little bit before when we we're playing through it, but uh, it is focusing on a new sub faction of the cultists that we call the moth, the wise mothman's enlightened. Um, they are one of the reasons we went with that direction is that we wanted to keep the cultists that you encounter in West Virginia a hostile faction. We didn't want to kind of dance the line between sometimes you're helping them and sometimes you're murdering all of them. Um, so we we wanted to go a route that still captured that kind of um, creepy, not quite trustworthy cult vibe, um, while also presenting them in a manner that the player could walk up and have a conversation with them without uh, getting into a fight. Uh, but that had kind of led us down this route of being able to create um, a pretty interesting dynamic between the two different cults and their uh, and their. Um, their belief system. So the the wise Mothman, uh, the, the the enlightened, they don't see the Mothman as a god, which is you know a big part of what the cultists that are in the game right now. They always refer to him as holy Mothman, and they speak about him like some otherworldly presence. Uh, they see the wise Mothman as basically their guru. He's he's kind of their guy, uh, their guide to all things, to life, to wisdom. Um, and so we, we just started to really build characters around the difference in in that thought. Um, that we have one section of people who saw, um, you know, the vision that that about the bombs, about what they call the flood, uh, you know, they turned that into kind of a more manic and violent group of people. And then we have um, the enlightened who see themselves as a bit more uh, of the educated scholars of of the Mothman's teaching. So kind of forget what the question was, but I hope that yeah, that addressed it. <laughs> no, that answers there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So was, uh, you're having these divisions, and I, I, I'm mm -hmm. sure we're going to start to understand more of how those divisions are fleshed out, how they came about, um, you know, that kind of stuff as things continue to develop. Um, and as we read more into like the little, you know, drops of information in the story that we, you know, in the in the game that we pick up and, you know, dig into the lore of it, which is mm -hmm. the you know the juicy bits that I love to to dig into. Um, now uh, this is one of those things that I, I I've been wondering. Um, uh, Mothman stuff has been popular for a long time. You know, there's movies about the Mothman, and it's, it's one of those cultural lore things, especially in the United States, that we've all been familiar with for a few decades at least. Um, but when you, when Fallout seventy six started, we we learned oh you're wor working cryptids in, and the Mothman was a big thing. But did the team and did you guys in particular know that it would become this popular? <laughs> That I mean, th there are there are Fallout seventy six fans that go to like they they take pilgrimages <laughs> and p send pictures of the Mothman statue's butt. You know, they may actually be cultists. Like 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 this. Yeah. This has become a very big thing. Did did you mm -hmm. really become this big? So I remember. Um... When I, when I came into the project, the Mothman had been designed and implemented already by that point. Um, and we were doing a play test for him. Uh, and it was where we were, we were, uh, the, the, one of the engineers, um, who worked on it had, you know, was designing the, the pop up and disappear type mechanic. And we were play testing internally. And I, I remember saying, and I, I, it was so arrogant of me as a person who just came in as like a brand new person saying, I think this character is going to be iconic for the series. I, I, so like, I kind of patted myself on the back when it became popular. I was like, I called it. I knew it. Cause yeah. it, it's just such a great character. Like the, the 76 interpretation of them is such an awesome uh, character design. I've got the little. He's actually. You might be able to see him right there. Um, so I was. A, I was just as a uh, 
wonder filled fan playing the content and not being a part of it i kind of felt like this guy's it's going to be huge he's so awesome um but i unfortunately i can't really speak to the process of putting him in there um or the, the, the thoughts on that because when i came in i was already gushing over him so <laughs> john do, do you have any thoughts I don't think anybody knew that Mothman, well, Carl, that anybody else knew that Mothman was going to be so popular. Um, they, you know, our, our fans love the Mothman. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it certainly resonates with them. Um, I, I hadn't heard too much about the Mothman before we had started 76. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, started doing some research and watching some documentaries. I was like, wow, this is this is a thing. And, you know, the whole Mothman Festival and, and Point Pleasant, it's really cool. I uh, so, yeah. I think the Fallout yeah. community, too, has really amplified how popular that cryptid was to begin with. I mean, I see so much fan art constantly on Twitter from all over the world with like different interpretations of there's Mothman in like a suit in an anime style. There's like yeah. a, ch a chunky <laughs> fuzzy one, like in a comic drinking coffee. It's, it's, yeah. it's wild. I'm going to need somebody to send me some images. Cause uh, I'm not familiar with the anime Mothman. That is right up my alley. I follow them. Love the Mothman. Like it's a big thing over there now. It's like, yeah. Like the Japanese Everybody. Fallout community, uh, the Fallout 76 community is huge and they do some crazy, uh, awesome fan art and camp builds. That's yeah, I love seeing what they do on Twitter. Yeah, it's, it's insane. It's absolutely crazy. A lot of talent. It's really, mm -hmm. really, really, really cool stuff. Um, so, okay. So g getting back to the lore stuff, I, I've got another lore question. I probably should have done this one next, but I just wanted to, I just wanted to do the popular Mothman one because I've just been wondering about that. But um, okay. So uh, it, speaking of the cult of the Mothman in the game, now we know that that, has evolved from a group of people who believed in like the creepy myth for, of you know the prophetic you know vision and you know they were kind of pre-war right the origins of mm -hmm. the, the yeah they, they started pre-war and survivors are survived thanks to the, you know the vision that brother charles received and um if that name charles sounds familiar there is a certain character uh who is in the mothman equinox who happens to share that same name uh so you know there's uh that said you won't you won't get much out of him in terms of uh dialogue but uh yeah they they were a a pre-war group um that transcended into kind of that that found footage style storytelling that we had at the beginning of fallout 76 um and then uh, we internally were super excited when in npcs were introduced to be able to see actual cultists in game as well and to see how they kind of changed over the the 25 years since the the uh yeah. the bomb strap yeah yeah and so that's where that's where my question is going it's like over that time they went from just being kind of this creepy you know they just believed in this kind of myth kind of uh, uh, not particularly dangerous group of people who just believed in this thing to becoming much more extremist and dangerous like so many things do in the wasteland right was there a specific event or something that led to that or was it just the time and the dangerous qualities of the wasteland that just kind of kind of led people to become more extreme well i i've got my own theories um but the th the thing about that's interesting about writing lore um, is that often it's collaborative um, and sometimes that collaboration is by accident even there's you're, you're writing one thing and it happens to mesh up against something else that some someone else has written um, so for me the the you know my major impact on lore is this this new edition of the enlightened and so I explored back into some of the earlier kind of ideas that were happening and and the the earlier uh arguments between them to kind of create this new sub faction of it uh but i i would not be the the source of information on the the hostile cultists the um the ones that we we fight throughout appalachia there's a ton of great lore there um and great minds behind it um so this is in some ways this was uh, a way of introducing the cult element without um I think giving up, giving away too much of what makes them mysterious and interesting, um, while still kind of you know letting you 
Would it, uh, were there, is there a jelly bean situation? Do we have to spin for a no, donation? No, no, you guys keep going. I got a, a Sage shout out for the donation. I had to do the jelly bean spin because we got a donation. So okay. I've landed on coconut or spoiled milk, and I know it's going to be something awful. Yep, fingers crossed on spoiled milk. Oh, boy. Mm. Probably. It's not looking great. Anyway. I wasn't uh, disappointed. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sage. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah. There, there is history for sure. There is a, there is a lot written that's in game. There's a lot written that's out of game, um, and you know, it's not, it's not something that I think. Even if I did have all the answers, I'd still hesitate to, to bring it all in because there's, a, there's a certain level of mystery that makes that kind of content so interesting. Um, and yeah. you know, we, we try to keep that in there as much as we can. Yeah, I right. remember last year when we had uh, Ferret on here. Um, that was something that he said. You know, a lot of the times. He knows in his head what the full story is, but he'll purposely delete things because he likes that mystery to exist so that we think mm -hmm. about it and conjecture and come up with our own stories and lore and that kind of thing. Absolutely. And sometimes it, we, it ends up going in exactly the way you thought from the very beginning. Um, and sometimes uh, the f even fans kind of participation in that story will start to let it grow and evolve in different ways. Um, I think the the popularity in general of cultists exceeded i think our expectations so you know the fan desire to see more of that is why we did something like mothman equinox is it, it came from that desire to want to participate in that more yeah people like the creepy stuff creepy yeah. stuff is good yeah, yeah. Like creepy stuff. Is good. now speaking speaking about prophecy and mothman and uh, maybe there's nothing you can tell us about it maybe maybe things haven't been written yet but is there something that the wise Mothman is trying to warn us about? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> I can summarize that as there's many things he's trying to warn us about. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I, I will say that in general, uh, he is communicating for a purpose. There's a reason he lands and he wants to, to talk to us. Now, I don't want to get anybody's hopes up. That doesn't mean you're ever going to know what that is or we're ever going to explore that but those are the types of thoughts we keep in the back of our head is like the, the motivations are a huge part of how we write a character and a lot of the times you will never even know what those motivations were maybe a character has a sister that we never even talk about as an no the the mothman does not have a sister i'm sorry but <laughs> shrubbery He's yeah. just <laughs> shrubberies and just want a nice little hedge right shrubbery. but yeah. In terms of what, you know, when we're thinking about, okay, what are some of the things that maybe these characters feel like they've heard from the Mothman? We start with, well, what is the Mothman actually trying to tell them? Um, but I, I don't want that to seem like that's some big, like, teaser for future content or anything. It's just yeah. the answer is yes. We, we know what the Mothman was trying to tell them. That doesn't, that doesn't mean the players are ever going to find out. Right. Um, yep. But there, there's, some, there's some little hints sprinkled throughout for some smaller elements um i'll say that uh you know certain characters may have heard certain things from him that are more true than others or their interpretations of it um are uh, are incorrect in many ways do you know what my theory has always been what's that when we first emerge from the vault he's watching us but doesn't touch us it's when mm -hmm. we start doing things in the world and and killing creatures and you know possibly nuking the world space that he gets a little cranky his mother nature's wrath so i'm thinking i'm thinking that he's he's watching what we're doing and oftentimes he's not satisfied with what we're doing and that's we should fun. we should yeah, uh, that kind of speculation you know that i think that's the power of shrouding something in mystery like that right you know? and, and we should clarify the difference too between the mothman uh the red-eyed mothman the yeah um the more standard you know version of it and the wise mothman as a as a separate character and you know, they're, what are their origins? How did they come to be? Maybe we know, um, you know, but it's not the, not the type of thing we explore yet or ever. Yeah. Ken, did you have any questions that you wanted to get to before we, I know we only have so much time, but. Yeah, we, we had a, a, a particularly one of the things that we wanted to talk about was, uh, so the Blue Ridge Caravan Company that, uh, that Carl, you had quite a lot to do with. We wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, so you were the primary designer for that. It has a lot of memorable characters, um, most notably Ares. For people who maybe um, did the event but maybe didn't pay attention to the lore and backstory, how did the caravan company form? 
Oh, the, the so um, the, yes, that is in the lore. So this is not um, head canon or speculation. Uh, but they were formed out of um, Joanna Mayfield, who is who was running a inherited uh, trucking company pre-war, um, and their tr- the trucking company was just called the Blue Ridge Trucking Company, um, and it ran trucks up and down the Blue Ridge Highway and all over the Appalachia region. Uh, post-war, as a, a um, business first person, uh, Joanna turned that business into a Brahmin shipping company instead and put the cargo on the back of Brahmins and con- tried to continue uh, kind of life as, as she knew it before uh, the bombs. And the company and the organization kind of grew around that it, it ends up becoming more of a um, protection company than it is a shipping company they they provide uh, protection for traders that are trying to sell their wares throughout the region um, so a lot of the characters who are actually B- Blue Ridge are the guards themselves um, Ares being one of them but there's a handful of others such as Tommy Tentos of uh, of the uh, weekend vendor fame uh, but or it's not weekend I'm sorry it's Wednesday? When does Minerva show up? It's been a while since I got to get Minerva deals. Anyway, players know. Yeah. Uh, Yell in chat if you know. (laughs) Yes, yes. So that I can actually get some new deals from Minerva. Uh, But they're they're more of, um, you know, hired help to uh, fight off the baddies as you're, uh, as they're shipping goods across the wasteland. I love that group. I, I've, that's been one of my favorite groups in 76, the Blue Ridge Caravan. It feels so, I get it. It feels so believable in a, in a post-apocalyptic world. In fun. no small part because of its logo. It has such a good logo. Um, just <laughs> when I first saw it, I was like, this is a, this looks like a um, organic coffee bean company <laughs> that I would buy. It looks, it looks great. But uh, Best part of waking up is Blue Ridge in your cup. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, nice. yeah. It looks like you have a T-shirt with it on there. Yeah, yeah. Who is Aries? Who is Aries? That's a good question. Um, so I mentioned before that sometimes you uh, you write something and you know the full story in your head um, ahead of that content going into the game. Um, and then sometimes that content gets to go into the game, uh, and that is the case with Aries. Uh, this is a spoiler. Um, for Steel Rain uh, and for certain other pieces of content. But he is the character Calvin Van Lowe. Um, A lot of players have figured this out already. The wiki, I mean, you can't even go to Ares' page without it just redirecting you to Calvin Van Lowe at this point. Um, So I think it's it's pretty widespread knowledge. But from the very beginning, we want it to, when, when we put did the lying low storyline we originally had calvin die be dead at the end of it you find calvin's corpse and we wanted to try to have a story that did not end you know with you discovering that the character you've been listening to on the holotapes has died um both out of just having a, a different kind of resolution than other content that we had already done but also just to to leave some air of mystery to it so it was really gratifying for me to finally get to reveal that hey this character weirdo in the mask aries he's also this character from this uh this earlier content that came out yeah it must be uh was it something that that you th- that you uh had an idea in terms of bridging the wastelander story into this and using him as kind of a bridging character? I'd say it was more of a now or never uh, type of thing. It's uh, It was the same thing with, with um, even introducing a character that was secretly him. Um, you know, he I, I, I had never necessarily anticipated that he would be a caravan guard as the, the job that he comes back into the game as, but I was already building Riding Shotgun, and I said, I need a group of characters. Here's, it's do this now or do this never, put the character in there. And when it came to Steel Rain, we had a point where we needed to be interacting um, with settlers where it made sense that, it, that the Blue Ridge Company was involved. So I said, now we could put Ares in, and why don't I just reveal it now? Because, you know, with it, we're gonna the the focus will move on other characters will be introduced so you you want to um to be able to give resolution to that story it's i'd say it's a it's a rare opportunity to get that chance to actually get the full thing uh in game rather than kind of staying as your own personal story it's a great evolution uh evolution too in terms of a, a character that we hear a lot about uh, but don't get a chance to meet so he gets this really interesting character arc in terms of how he started, 
what he went through and endured um it's it's interesting to see him as one of the few surviving characters that uh that you meet after all he went through yeah yeah it was uh definitely uh did did not think i was going to get the chance to do that so i was very happy that i did well that's awesome i think that's uh tom did you have any more questions uh what else did i have in here i know i had some others um oh gosh i don't remember which ones i put in we have a big document full of all these questions but uh they all get jumbled into the same document which maybe to uh you guys what's the, most no- what's the most notable experience that's happened to you while playing fallout 76 Stands wow. out in your mind the most. Oh, wow! Most notable experience. Well, I, I, I can share when the first thing that I was really the big, like this. This goes way back, but the first thing that was, and this isn't specific to an event in the game. It was just the game itself. Um, my wife and I, when we first started dating, uh, one of the things that we bonded over was playing video games, and we started dating. 13, 14 years ago. And so Fallout 3 was new early in our relationship. And uh, she liked playing video games too, but she had never played any Bethesda games. And so I was able to introduce her to Fallout. And then I was playing Fallout. And then she was playing Fallout. I handed her the controller eventually. It became one of those things where she would help make the decisions, but I would play. And then eventually she was playing and I was watching. And so she ended up playing. And then she ended up playing other Fallout games. And you know, New Vegas and Fallout 4. So when 76 came out, we actually got to play the game together. And so 76 became one of those games where it was just when it when it came out, it was like, we're both in a Fallout game at the same time. This is amazing. You know, it was just like, the, just the feeling of that was like, and it's not specific to a specific thing happening in the game. It was just being able to play in a Fallout game with my wife simultaneously was, was just... It, w- it wasn't something I ever expected to do. And so that was by itself an amazing thing. It's awesome. Yeah. For me, I've never played an online game of any kind in my entire life. <laughs> I've played a ton of PC games. Um, I've been a PC gamer since the, the mid 90s. Um, and when I first heard that that 76 was an online game, my immediately thought was some of the YouTube videos I've seen about Call of Duty. And I tend to be a fairly casual player. Uh, at the end of my workday, I didn't want to, to go into a world and then like have a 12 year old just yelling obscenities at me <laughs> to relax. But uh, it, it hit home for me, I think on the, the second day, when I was in game walking around and you know a, a lot of people coming to the game now won't ever experience the game the same way that we did in year one um with with no NPCs and uh area chat always on so uh, area voice so um walking around I I heard you know someone talking in the distance and it becomes a question of, um, is this person going to shank me or could it be a friend? Um, which, which made it a very real experience for me. So I decided the hell with it. So I, I went over, um, we started talking and hanging out. Um, and that led to, to meeting more people and making friends. And um, amongst ourselves, we started role playing. Uh, we had a caravan company called the Appalachia Trading Company. And it was the same kind of thing where we, we we were more guards protecting travel routes. So we would role play in game, kind of walking routes. Um, and that ended up inspiring what, what became the story for the podcast. So I think for me, this game um, opened me up to connecting with people in a way that I never had before, in a way that really enriched my life. And I'll, I'm forever grateful for. So I can talk about um specifics um when and this this has happened a few times when wastelanders came out every time there's been a major update to the game where actual locations have changed 
and I've played enough to be familiar with the location and then to see the location actually shift as if time has passed and the world has changed. Um, that to me is very interesting every time, especially when I'm not told ahead of time about what's going to change, uh, even in little ways. Rediscovering a world that I'm familiar with already only to go back to a location and not know what's going to be changed is, I find, is very interesting. Um, so if I could give my two cents to, to two guys working on this game, it would be do things like that and don't tell us that they're coming. <laughs> um, yeah, because that stuff is like going to going like going to where the crash crash space station is and then going, oh, well, the Raiders are going to build a base here and then being expecting to go find a Raider base is cool because, oh, now I get to explore a Raider base and there's going to be a bunch of stories and quests and things to explore here. I know that I'm going to get to experience that, that awesome. But then stumbling into a building nearby that I didn't know was going to be going to be changed. And all of a sudden there's differences there and I didn't expect that. That's even cooler because I discovered it on my own, right? Because I because the people who've been playing this game have been playing it, so many of us, a long time. And we kind of know what every little shack looks like. We know what every little cave looks like. But it would be really cool to stumble into that little shack because we're just grinding, we're just trying to collect, you know, glue and then going, wait a minute, this door wasn't here before. <laughs> Yeah, like a, a fantastic example of what you guys did is when the the Van Lo quest line dropped um, and you were introducing the Sheep Squatch, the way in which it was slowly done with you stumbling on, you know, a pile of, of dead cow carcasses and then you hear something in your distance and you're like, what the hell is that? And then you meet yeah. the imposter and you're like, okay, where's the real deal? And then I remember the day that it dropped in game and everyone was freaking out online like oh my god it's real like look at this thing and we fought it and it was terrifying and the way in which that slowly evolved and we're looking for it but we can't find it was masterful beautifully done yeah and i will say that was not an accident um that was really well planned out and i need to give a shout out to our level design team um we we tell really cool stories here at bethesda but some of the best stories, some of my favorite stories from past games have actually come from the level design team and then environmental storytelling. Um, we, we, our, our team does it like no one else. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and even in the single player games, the environmental storytelling and discovering things on my own are some of my favorite things to do in those games. So it, 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 just secret, secret updates, secret storytelling. Pipe and is just, life. <laughs> Even just changing the location of stuff, you know, even if even if like on the next update, all of a sudden a place where I expect mole miners to be, they're scorched there. And now I'm wondering why are they scorched here? There's always mole miners here. Like little things like that will get the community talking and wondering what's going on. Like we're school kids talking about the level warp we found in Mario level four two. you know, like <laughs> that kind of stuff like like it, it, it goes a long way because it just makes us start wondering about things. And I like, man, mm, that will like, place a mug somewhere in the world on your behalf that will just be there now. And Tom will be uh, able to dedicate like three episodes to what is going on with the mug. <laughs> What's going on with the mug? Or, or, or just a robot that just wanders around with like a little banner, uh, like that just has something scrawled on it. Like people would be like, what does the little scrawled banner on this new robot wandering around the wasteland mean? Like little tiny little updates like that, Th like little things like that will go like will, a long, long way. And like, sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll go crazy over things that may end up being nothing. And I feel like you guys just sit back and like, look at these guys go. A great example of that is when the standing stones dropped and, and there are like, uh, people in the army who who specialize in decrypting taking a look at the designs on the standing stones and saying well this and, and maybe it it aligns to different points of the map and we're gonna find like that <laughs> like I, right. yeah or a it radio get us talking. that has like morse code on it that translates into some cryptic message that's just like barely translatable to something that's a hint about some tiny little thing. And th the community would go nuts about it. And we would spend so much time trying to figure out what it is. We do. But like those tiny little things are probably not that hard to implement in a game in a tiny little patch, but would buy you so much actual attention from the community. Um, 
that's my two cents. Yeah, I will say it is. It, it's an amazing thing to put in effort to a, a two-part massive storyline surrounding the Brotherhood of Steel, only for most people to be talking about a pipe that's sticking out of the ground with a note <laughs> yeah. next to it. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's true. It's true. And, you know, and and maybe maybe these little things lead up to the next big one. But like those little things are probably, you know, a fraction of the amount of time it takes to develop that big thing, but would go a long way to giving people something to, you know, invest their attention in. There literally now is a Pipe is Life uh, cult <laughs> group, role players who that's that's all that they're about. They're, they, they follow the way of the pipe and it, it's it's interesting. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we have an awesome community. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that we do. Yeah. So that, oh. that's my thought. But um yeah, we, we love what you guys do. Um we're you know, we're always, you know, I mean I, if you can't tell, we're hanging on every little detail because we're just so excited about every little thing that comes out. So And now I'm terrified about everything that I said during this. <laughs> 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 John laughs knowing that I'm doomed to coming out of this. Oh man, I've been chatting with Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome to talk with fellow gamers, especially you know gamers who love what what uh, what uh, the games that that we were privileged enough to make. You know, games games as a, as a service, something ongoing, continuing, evolving the story, I think it's a very powerful, uh, powerful tool. And it, it's, it's great to be able to talk to, to folks that enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a, a big pleasure for us too, to get, you know, a little bit more insight into the, the process, you know, the behind the scenes. So mm -hmm. guys for your time talking with us. Um, Andy, you have any other thoughts or questions? No, that was uh, that was it. The uh, the one thing I want to remind everybody while while we're still here, um, follow for hope is going all the way through next weekend. We have some really amazing programming coming up. Uh, we've got the dweller drop that we're going to be doing tomorrow night that Carl has competed in and actually kicked everybody's butt in. Uh, and I'm still convinced to this day that he used some kind of secret cheat code. Um, did really well there. You can't um, prove it. We got uh, a very raidery thing to do, Carl. By the way. That's a very raidery thing to do. <laughs> Carl's not going to be able to live that down now. Mm -mm. Uh, and then next week, really, the the height of um, of Follow for Hope is going to be our live production of a Christmas Carol. Pete Hines is going to be joining us uh, with as Jacob Marley, Wes Johnson as Ebenezer Scrooge, Jan Johns, Courtney Taylor. Um, We've got just an entire roster of some amazing uh, Bethesda voice actors joining us for that. That will be next, uh, sorry, December 17th. Um, that'll be kicking off on, so definitely don't miss that. Um, we'll be going on here. Please support St. Jude. We are now, uh, since the start of the stream, we've crossed another mark. We are at uh, $45,267.54. We're almost halfway to our goal. And uh, really, this, this community has has really turned it up. Where we are now, we've paid for two life-saving surgeries for kids through St. Jude. So the community is, is literally funding life-saving surgery, which is awesome. That's amazing. That's all we yeah. got. Yeah, thank you guys for having me on here. So, uh, thank you both so fun. much for doing this. To plug into everything else we're doing, check out robotsradio.net. Also, look up the Robots Radio YouTube for videos about Fallout and other things. And So, how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 US and DC. 18 plus entered by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited.